Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Saturdays are for the Byzantines podcast. My name is Professor Wren, and I am your host. Again, I am not claiming that I am a college professor. I'm not employed by any American or or any other university, for that matter. No American university, no inter, what would be for me international university. Just a guy talking about Byzantine history. I am a teacher. Where I employed by a university, my title would probably be professor. So there you go. That's the title. If you are listening on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button, hit the like button as well, and then ring the notification bell so you never miss another episode. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please do subscribe and give us a five-star rating. Only five-star ratings are allowed. If you are listening on Spotify, give us a follow. And if you are listening on Google Play, uh, give us the follow, subscribe, whatever it is you do on Google Play. And if there's a possibility for a rate, I've never actually used, I've never looked at like the, the podcast platform for Google, the, the user interface on Google Play. But if you can give us a rating, again, only the highest possible rating is allowed. So today we are going to jump back in to the reign of Emperor Constantine, where we last left off. Constantine defeated his rival in the West, Maxentius, leaving Constantine as the official Augustus in the West, along with his imperial colleague in the East, uh, who was Licinius. And the before the battle where Constantine defeats Maxentius, that's called the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, Constantine has an epiphany with Christianity. He looks up into the sky, he sees the Chai Rho, which is the Greek... Uh, first two Greek letters in the word Christos, meaning Christ. Uh, that's the P. Looks like a letter P with an X right through it. If you look it up on Google, you can see exactly what I'm talking about. As well as the sign, uh, the words above the chiro in hoc signo vinces, which is Latin phrase for in this sign you will conquer. And then Constantine sees this sign, has an epiphany, believes that the Christian God has sent him the sign, tells all of his soldiers to paint the chiro onto their shields before they go into battle, and they win a smashing victory. Now, I said in the last episode that I would address the conversation, debate, uh, what have you, with uh, Constantine's epiphany to Christianity. Was it a political, was it something he did because it was politically convenient? Or was it something he did because he uh, he had an authentic conversion to Christianity? And I'm going to take the position that this was that Constantine really had an epiphany with Christianity, really believed it, saw the symbol in the sky itself, and uh, so let's let's analyze why why was this? And I, I'm I'm also so my position is it wasn't even politically convenient for Constantine to to convert to Christianity. Now, why is that the case? So at the time, uh, at the time when Constantine is rising uh, politically, um, Christianity was a, was only just recently stopped, had just recently stopped being persecuted, right? Diocletian had carried out uh, the most hostile, most vicious persecution against Christians of any Roman emperor. Uh, you know, I often think that Nero might have been the most uh, cruel about it, but Diocletian certainly uh, persecuted Christians on much more wide scale than anyone before him. Uh, Nero only persecuted the Christians within the city of Rome. With Diocletian, the persecutions were across the entire empire. No, no other emperor persecuted, in the words of our president, although he's is still president for a little longer, nobody persecuted Christians the way that Diocletian did it. It was really tremendous. Um, and so uh, uh, there's no real advantage in terms of, oh, I can unify everybody around this thing that everybody loves, right? Uh, uh, Christianity is still, uh, still a minority religion as well. It's not that it is, uh, Christianity hasn't become the majority religion, uh, certainly not in the West. Uh, that would not come for a little while longer. And even in the East, although Christianity is growing more in the East, it's still it's still a minority. Again, still recently persecuted. Not exactly an easy thing to unite an entire empire around, right? If anything, it would have been easier for Constantine to try to unite the empire around paganism to fight against the Christians. Okay, if you think about it, the uh, the Romans, for example, 
um, their their pagan religion for them was very much not not just a you know I go to church on 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 Sunday and that's it and I don't think about it anywhere else. This was intertwined into many uh, different aspects of the Roman Empire's culture. In the Roman Republic, for example, you had the elected position of Pontifex Maximus, or essentially the high priest. And that was not a necessarily a religious position, although perhaps a, a, someone who was a, a priest might end up in that position one way or another, but typically it was an elected political position. Um, sacrilege and blasphemy were laws persecuted... <laughs> Uh, or no, excuse me, laws prosecuted by the state because uh, anything that was seen as blasphemous or uh, sacrilege, right? If if you did something to offend the gods and the gods brought their wrath down on the the city or the empire or what have you, that's not just something that affects one person individually. That's something that uh, affects an entire community, right? It it affects the entire city. So. Just hypothetically, let's say someone did something to affect the gods and the gods uh, didn't send rain one year and all the crops died because there wasn't enough rain. Well, that's going to lead to a lot of people uh, starving to death because of a lack of food. So it's not just a crime against, you know, it's not just something one person does and it's like, oh, well, that's, you know, that's your religion over there. The state isn't getting, no, no, no. The Roman government saw that as a crime against Everybody, not just something that one individual does. Uh, you also have to take into consideration that there are a lot of uh, this religion is deeply tied into family, okay, and, and households. So, for example, Romans had household gods. They had the Lores and the Panates, which were household gods. These were gods that people had shrines in their houses to. Um, there's some family ties to that as well, right? It's kind of maybe has something to do with uh, ancestral things. So it's like your your family lineage. This is what your father worshipped before you and his father his father his father <laughs> worshipped before him, right? And uh, this is why um, in the New Testament Jesus says something along the lines of, um, you know, this is going to divide uh, father against brother, mother against daughter. And so part of the reason for that is because if you have these household gods that have been in your family for generations and you come home one day and you say to your dad, uh, I'm going to, I'm leaving that behind and uh, I'm going to convert to this new thing called Christianity. And your father would say, to you, well, what do you mean? You're leaving all this behind? This is the shrine here that your grandfather built, you know? And, and so it's almost a forsaking of the family lineage, lineage that came before you. Uh, all of these very, very divisive issues, right? You're, you're dividing families. You're, you know, people who have a, a mindset of religion is very much tied in with the state. You know, now, now trying to kind of separate those two, as the as the uh, the Catholic Church will uh, attempt to kind of take take some of their own control for, uh, for themselves away from the state right these are these are all things that are going to be uh, uh, rather divisive and not in keeping with what Rome had been for for many centuries before that so if anything it's politically disadvantageous for Constantine to take this route not politically advantageous for him to take that route Okay, now let's move on to the Edict of Milan, which is one of the first things that Constantine does when he rises to the uh, uh, position of Augustus of the West. Uh, Constantine will issue the Edict of Milan along with his Eastern colleague, uh, Licinius, and he's also working with the Bishop of Milan, who is St. Ambrose. Uh, the three of them, kind of working in conjunction, come up with the Edict of Milan, which makes a number of concessions to the church. So, one of the uh, concessions that the Edict of Milan makes to the church is that bishops can resolve personal or civil dis disputes. Now, for those of you who might not be aware, a bishop is a member of the Catholic clergy. So, you uh, start out a guy will go to a religious seminary to become a priest. One of the first uh, uh, positions he will be ordained to or moved up to is uh, deacon. Okay, so some guys will remain a deacon. There's a position called a permanent deacon, and those guys will be deacons for their entire life or 
un unless they decide to discern out of it for whatever reason or to leave it. Uh, and then other guys will go from being a deacon to being ordained a priest. And then uh, some priest will get promoted to be a bishop. And a bishop is in charge of what's called a diocese. And that's just a regional leadership position. Uh, in a, yeah, a bishop is in charge of all of the churches in a particular geographic area. Okay. And then uh, there are also some people who some priests will get promoted to archbishop. Now an archbishop is in charge of an archdiocese, which is just a major metropolitan area. So for example, in the United States, you know, New York, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, Chicago, these are all archdioceses uh, for the Catholic Church because they're large metropolitan areas. Something like uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania is just a diocese. It's not quite as big. So bishops and archbishops basically do the same job, but just in different different areas. Okay, so why, why would you allow a bishop to resolve uh, civil disputes? Why is that not done by a government authority figure? Why is that not done by like a judge or something? Well, first of all, this allows for some of the caseload for those uh, government workers, for some of those judges, etc., uh, takes some of the work off their plate. So now they have time to handle other business, uh, which at times would, would stack up and be, you know, your desk is full of all of these these things that you have to take care of. Uh, secondly, a bishop might be uh, the only educated person in a particular area. So let's say, for example, maybe there are no government officials in your town. Maybe the closest judge or other official is in the town over, and it's more. But you have a but you have a bishop in your town. Uh, it would be just more convenient for saying that you don't have to travel. If you take some sort of personal dispute to the person who can handle it in your town versus having to travel to the town over for you to do that, because obviously you know, people don't have cars, you know, a 30 mile distance today that today could be covered in you know, 30, 40 minutes uh, would take a day, multiple days uh, for, for people to cover back then. And so because of this, you end up in situations where uh, a local bishop might resolve a personal or, or a civil dispute. So what exactly might that mean? Well, just to take an easy example, let's say you have two farmers and they have a property dispute. And one farmer says that his land ends on, the, uh, on one side of the river and the other farmer says that, no, your land ends on your side of the river and my land ends on my side of the river. So the, the border is in dispute. One farmer says his land goes over the river. The other farmer says that, no, my land ends at my side of the river and your land ends at your side of the river. And so those farmers who have that dispute might take their case to their local bishop, and both of, both of them would kind of present their case, and the bishop would try to find a way to settle the case that was agreeable to both parties so that they wouldn't get angry at each other, and one might not you know, go into the other guy's land and try to set on fire at night or anything like that. Of course, we wanna, you want to keep the peace, and so this is one thing that the Edict of Milan allows. Another thing that the Edict of Milan changed was a uh, the Romans had a tax on single men. Men who were not married had to pay an extra tax. Now, the reason for this in the past was uh, the Roman Empire uh, wanted to encourage men to get married. It, you know, obviously, uh, married men tend to be more responsible and more productive than single men. As well, uh, man gets married, has children, right? His boys can go off and become soldiers. Soldiers are useful to the state. His daughters will go off and become husbands to soldiers, right? You don't want discontent men who, you know, might not be able to find a woman, right? Of course, the more the more women you have around, the more potential mates you have for those angry soldiers who, when they come home from war, you want to make sure that they're not uh, uh, dissatisfied because a guy who has a military background and he's not satisfied, um, worried that might become violent, right? But obviously, with Christianity now uh, at the forefront of everybody's mind, uh, uh, Christian clergy, being some of them being single at this point in time, uh, th this, this tax was kind of a burden on them because, first of all, they're generally not super wealthy to begin with. You know, some of them living a life of poverty. Uh, uh, 
could simply just couldn't afford to pay the tax or it was overly burdensome to them. And so that tax on single men was removed. Now, the interesting, interesting tidbit about this is that it, at this particular time, it was actually the Western clergy, the, uh, the Western Catholic, or, well, it wasn't, there wasn't the split between Catholic and Orthodox at this time, but so Western clergy that was allowed to be married and it was the Eastern clergy that, was, uh, that remained single. And obviously, if you're aware today, Western Catholic clergy are the single ones, and Eastern Catholics as well as Eastern Orthodox uh, allow their clergy to be married. So that there was a flip that went on there in the 11th century, kind of around the time of the Schism of 1054. A third thing that the Edict of Milan did was it sent imperial money to the church to use to rebuild or repair churches that the Roman government had previously destroyed. Uh, this is not unlike what happened in Russia at the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, obviously, the uh, Soviet Union was not a fan of Christianity, so they went around blowing up a lot of Russian Orthodox churches. So when the Soviet Union fell and Russia has a new government, the Russian government paid reparations to the Russian Orthodox Church to rebuild some of their churches and repair other churches. Uh, the Russian Orthodox Church was one of two institutions that survived the Soviet Union. So Russian Orthodox Church being one, and I, it was the Academy of Sciences, or it might have a different name, but it was like the National Academy of Sciences that also survived. So those were the, <laughs> those were the only two bodies that survived the Soviet Union in, in Russia. The Roman government also gifted uh, the church uh, in some in some circumstances Roman basilicas to use as churches. Now, a basilica in uh, pagan Roman in pagan Roman times uh, was kind of a judicial building. It was a place where you would go to have uh, you would go and uh, uh, bring cases to uh, a local government official. Uh, Sometimes people would also just show up there to kind of see who was there and maybe do some business with some guy, but important people would show up. Uh, and if you had a case, you brought it to be heard at the Basilica. But with Christianity, now Basilica, the floor plan of the Basilica is going to be used um, in building churches. Now, if you uh, go to a Catholic church, uh, in all likelihood, uh, your church's floor plan is very similar to that of a basilica. If you just Google uh, Roman basilica floor plan, you will notice uh, there's a lot of really good images of it up on Google, and you'll notice that your church layout in all likelihood is very similar, unless your church was built uh, maybe uh, from the 1950s onward. Uh, if your church was built in like the 20s, 1910s uh, and before, your church is going to have more of the basilica uh, floor plan. More modern churches are built in more of a, a round or a semicircle shape, so it's going to look a, that'll look a little different for you. Another thing that the Edict of Milan allowed for was the right of sanctuary, and so uh, this is when if you are being chased by an angry mob, uh, you can run into a church, and the mob is not supposed to chase you in there, right? So you might have seen. In the uh, Disney cartoon movie, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, when the hunchback goes down, uh, uh, runs or, or jumps out of the bell tower of Notre Dame and the gypsy is about to be burned at the state. I, what was her name? Esmeralda, maybe? I, can't, I, I don't know her name. Um, but Quasimodo comes down and he grabs her off the, uh, off the pyre that she's about to be burned on and then he climbs back up the bell tower with her on her back on his back and he uh he gets to the ledge and he holds her up and goes sanctuary sanctuary right and so that so then the, the, the mob that was about to burn her couldn't chase her into the church right so she was safe it, it, that's exact that's exactly uh what the right of sanctuary would have looked like in in past now constantine also began using his imperial gravitas to uh select bishops, which he would have found friendly to him. Now, this is going to become a struggle between the church and secular authorities for years to come, uh, which is going to result in the investiture controversy, which will be in the Middle Ages. Basically, uh, the church does not like that the secular state has so much power in who uh, gets certain offices, who gets promoted, who, uh, you know, 
who gets what job, et cetera. And the church would rather uh, have control over that for itself and not have to have the secular authority constantly getting into the mix of things. Uh, but because this is not a medieval history podcast, that's about as far as I'll go into that topic. Now, Constantine also finds himself at the center of two church controversies regarding heresies during his reign. Now, a heresy, just so we can get a definition right off the bat, is uh, a false Christian teaching made by a baptized Christian. So, for example, a Catholic priest who makes false uh, Catholic teachings would be a heresy, or he would be a heretic preaching heresy. Okay, and so the two heresies that Constantine is involved with are Donatism and Arianism. Now, we're going to tackle Donatism first here, uh, partly because it's first chronologically and partly because it's a little uh, simpler to deal with than Arianism. So Donatism began in North Africa with a bishop named Donatus Magnus, so Donatism named after Donatus, the bishop. Uh, And and the issue started during the persecution with Diocletian. So what was happening was, as we said in previous episodes, um, Christians were sometimes offered uh, a way out of their execution under the Roman persecutions. And the way you got out of being executed was you made a sacrifice to the Roman gods and uh, denounced your Christianity and uh, publicly announced that you were now going back to or just now worshiping the, the, the Roman pagan gods. And that would save your, save your life, basically. Well, a number of Christians, whether they really meant it or not, uh, did denounce their faith, did make sacrifices to pagan gods. Now, I'm sure plenty of them would go out and do that in public just to just so they wouldn't get executed and then go home and they'd still have like a, a crucifix up in their room or whatever and still pray to the Christian god. Uh, but maybe some of the maybe some of them also went back to worshiping pagan gods. You know, these these issues are sometimes a bit more complicated than than they appear. But either way, now with Constantine being around and Christianity being tolerated and promoted, even uh, the question becomes: Well, what do we do with the Christians who denounce their faith and now want to come back into the church? You know, are uh, lay Christians, meaning uh, lay lay people, are just uh, not not members of the clergy. So are lay people allowed back into the church? And then are uh, the clergymen, are they allowed back in the church? Are they still pre, you know, are they still priests and bishops? And then the other question becomes are the sacraments that those priests and bishops who renounce their faith, uh, the sacraments they performed and administered, are those sacraments still valid? That was the question that was brought up by the Donatist heresy. And uh, the Donatists said, no, we could not allow uh, Christians who denounce their faith to come back into the church. And they would also not allow uh, those priests and bishops who renounce their faith back into the church. They believed that only people who were totally pure and completely flawless were worthy of being part of the priesthood. And so because those guys had renounced their faith, they were no good. Can't have them. Now, obviously, this is uh, a bit of an absurd uh, uh, stance to take in, in terms of Christian uh, theology. And it's pretty, it's pretty simple if you think about it. So the, the idea that you have to, that, uh, for a person to be a Catholic priest, they have to be totally flawless, no mistakes, totally pure. Well, that describes absolutely nobody. Everybody who, every human who has ever lived has had flaws. Every human who has lived has been in some way impure, even if it's just a a mild form of impurity. All humans are still in some way flawed. All humans in some way sin throughout their life. Uh, And so if this is the standard, if this is the barrier to entry to, to the clergy, well, you're not going to have any priests because only the only one who has walked among us who has been perfect is Jesus. And he's not, he's not down here on earth anymore. So you're going to end up with a sparsely, a sparsely populated clergy. And not to mention the fact, right, uh, obviously Jesus preached about like the, uh, the parable of the prodigal son, you know, bringing, bringing the son back who had gone and uh, uh, blew all of his 
father's money on hookers and cocaine, basically. Uh, his father, when, when the boy comes uh, groveling back to him, his father embraces him with open arms, right? This is kind of the mentality that Christians are supposed to have regarding people who have messed up. So long, as, so long of course, as they really are sorry for what they did. Now, the Donatists were uh, even uh, raising some hell in, the, in North Africa, not just theologically, but also in the streets. There were some uh, uh, worries about revolts. There were some riots going on. And so Constantine, uh, wanting to keep the peace in the empire, uh, decided uh, to go talk to the Pope about potentially calling a church council. Now, all a church council is, is a meeting of as many priests and deacons and bishops and archbishops and cardinals and the Pope himself. Uh, they all get together and iron out a particular issue that uh, Catholics have questions about. So in this case, there's questions about what's going on with the Donatists. Are they correct? Are they incorrect? And so Constantine goes and talks to the Pope about this, and the Pope agrees that it's an issue worth discussing. And so the Pope then calls a church council to settle the issue of Donatism. And that was uh, uh, brought up at the Council of Arles in 314. Now, the, the church council rules against the Donatists, saying that the sacraments administered by priests who had previously denounced their faith remain valid, and that their clerical positions also remain valid. So these guys are still priests, and even if, like for example, uh, you had been married by a priest who had denounced his faith but returned back to the church, uh, that marriage would still be a valid marriage. And as well, lay Christians who had denounced their faith would also be welcomed back into the church. Now, just because the church council made this ruling does not mean that the Donatists were happy with it and went along with it. The Donatists actually refused to accept any ruling that came out of the Council of Arles. So Constantine said, all right, you want to play hardball? Uh, he threatened, first of all, to send in military to put down any unrest that occurred as a result of the tensions between the Donatists and the uh, uh, the more the, the, the Orthodox Christians there, he also later commanded that the Donatists turn over their churches, uh, presumably to the Roman state. Um, but they refused to do that. Many of them, Donatus himself, refused to turn over his church to Constantine, and so Constantine sent in the Roman military to arrest Donatus take him away, seize his church, and seems it seems that uh, Donatist might have been executed by the Roman military. It's, he, died in, he died in their custody one way or the other. It's not clear exactly how he dies, but one might. It's not too hard to, to imagine a situation where Donatist was executed by the Roman military. Now, after this, some pockets of Donatism remained in North Africa, but they were, you know, after their leader was arrested and possibly executed, they kind of got the message to uh, just sit there quietly and not cause any trouble. And so they're there, but they're not, they're not causing a stir. They're, uh, uh, for the most part, just keeping them themselves. And so Constantine says, all right, we'll just leave them alone. And eventually they'll just, they'll just die out. And eventually the Donatist heresy does die out. Although, of course, as with all heresies, it doesn't happen right away. Uh, it generally takes more time than you might initially realize for these things to die off. And that's where we're going to call it for this episode. Next episode, tune in. We're going to talk about Constantine and Arianism and the Council of Nicaea. That's one of my favorite uh, things to talk about. It's one of my favorite things to teach. If you've gotten to this point in the video, first of all, thank you for listening. Really appreciate everyone uh, who's who's listening to this podcast. Uh, hopefully, in the near future, we'll get an audio upgrade. I'm currently uh, uh, doing this on a USB uh, a headset microphone, uh, so I understand the audio quality might be not be that great. Uh, the mic is. Uh, uh, closer to my mouth than I would like, so I apologize that you can hear probably more than you would like. I'm I'm hoping by certainly by like episode ten, we'll have a microphone upgrade here. Uh, if you've gotten to this point in the episode, I also remind you if you're watching this or listening on YouTube, 
uh, gently tap that like button, hit the subscribe button as well, and then ring the notification bell so that you never miss a, another episode. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, uh, give us a subscribe as well as a five-star rating. Only five-star ratings are allowed. Nothing less will be tolerated. If you're consuming this podcast on Spotify, please give us a follow. And then if you're listening on Google Play as well, do whatever it is that, you know, follow, subscribe, whatever, give us a, give us the top rating on, on Google Play. And so that's all for this time. And uh, we will see you all in the next episode.